T-minus three, two, one. Atlas engine ignition. Lift off of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy Rocket. From Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, UA presents live Delta IV launch coverage. At Space Launch Complex 6, a Delta IV rocket is fueled and ready to launch the NROL-47 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Underhill. I'm a propulsion engineer at United Launch Alliance in our Human and Commercial Services team and your host for today's launch. In a few seconds, the launch count will enter a planned 15-minute hold. This hold gives the launch team time to conduct final systems checks and resolve outstanding issues prior to entering the terminal count. At this time, the team is working an issue on our ground helium system. We do not yet have a new T0, but we'll keep you posted as updates become available. At the request of our customer, today's live mission coverage will conclude following confirmation of payload fairing jettison, which is scheduled to occur about three minutes after liftoff. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. While the team continues final preps, let's take a look at a preview of today's flight. The following profile details the important events of this mission using approximate times. We have ignition and we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance. The Delta IV RS 68A main engine and two strap-on solid rocket motors ignite to lift the vehicle away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Delta IV begins its initial pitch and yaw maneuvers to attain the proper ascent profile and minimize aerodynamic loads. Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 49 seconds. At 55 seconds, the vehicle reaches maximum dynamic pressure. The strap-on solid rocket motors, or SRMs, are jettisoned 100 seconds into flight. Approaching payload fairing jettison, the Delta IV is burning propellant at a rate of more than 1,950 pounds per second, more than 70 miles in altitude, 63 miles downrange, and traveling at a speed of more than 5,400 miles per hour. The payload fairing is jettisoned at approximately 3 minutes, 10 seconds. ULA is using a Delta IV Medium Plus 5-2 configuration rocket to launch the NROL-47 mission. This is the 36th Delta IV launch since the inaugural flight in 2002 and the third flight of the 5-2 configuration. Built in Decatur, Alabama, the Delta IV Medium Plus 5-2 rocket includes a common booster core powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engine and two orbital ATK solid rocket motors. An Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10B2 engine powers the Delta Cryogenic second stage. The payload is protected during ascent by a 5-meter diameter payload fairing. On December 11th, the encapsulated payload fairing was transported to Space Launch Complex 6 and made it to the Delta IV rocket. On January 6th, the mobile assembly shelter was rolled to its launch position. It protects the Delta IV rocket from the wind and fog so common to its location here on California's Pacific Coast. At approximately 5 a.m. Thursday, January 11th, the MST, or Mobile Service Tower, was rolled back, revealing the Delta IV rocket. Using 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 psi, the 10 million pound MST is raised 8 inches to begin the move. Using a carriage transporter system traveling at about a quarter mile per hour, 
It takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST 300 feet east of the Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV rocket stands 220 feet tall, or about 22 stories, and weighs just over three quarters of a million pounds fully fueled. The Delta IV RS-68A main engine and two solid rocket motors produce more than a million pounds of thrust at liftoff. engaged in the research and development, acquisition, launch, and operation of innovative overhead reconnaissance systems necessary to meet the needs of the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. The NRO is recognized for its transformational intelligence collection systems that are used to develop highly accurate military targeting data, support international peacekeeping and humanitarian relief operations, and to assess the impact of natural disasters. The art for today's mission depicts a classic battle between good and evil and represents the NRO's dedication to mission, military expertise, and camaraderie. The Latin phrase means, evil will never prevail, signifying NRO's commitment to national security. This morning, I had a chance to talk with Toli Telienchitz, UAA's Director of Launch Operations. Let's take a look. Tony, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. The launch team worked through several technical issues yesterday. Can you tell us a bit about the countdown? Sure. A very exciting countdown yesterday. Um, we had a lot of, of activity occurring on the net and off the net to be able to deal with some of the issues that occurred. You know, the day before, we lost the window because of the weather. We, we weren't be able to actually even move the tower. Um, and so the beginning of the window yesterday, we were dealing with the weather. It had come down significantly, but we were able to overcome that challenge. And then through the count, we ran into a couple of different issues in, in different areas. And you, you may or may not have heard them on the, the countdown network, but uh, we had some range activities, uh, right. actually a foul, fouled range with the boat at one point. Uh, and then we had some ground system issues that we had to deal with. Uh, overall, the team did an incredible job of coordinating those activities and doing their job to make sure that we were maintaining a safe and, and secure environment for the rocket and prepared when, it, when available to be able to successfully launch it. So a lot of the discussion yesterday took place on the anomaly net. Can you walk us through some of the different nets or channels that the team has available and kind of the process that they follow to resolve issues? Sure. Launch is all about communication, right. being able to successfully coordinate activities and communicate actions for the team. Um, one of the key areas that everybody hears is the countdown net, countdown one. Uh, and, and that's actually a very limited discussion, specifically focused on commands and, and situational awareness of what's going on. But behind that, there are a number of nets, including management net, an engineering net, and, uh, and a very important channel, which is the anomaly net. Normal engineering activity um, that has to be dealt with can be done on the, on the engineering net. And there are a lot of, act, a lot of responses that, that are basically just an engineering response. We, we can direct the team to do something. Uh, and that goes back to the management channel for implementation on channel one. But if there's a, an activity which is kind of out of uh, process that we need to go deal with, we take the team to the anomaly channel. On the anomaly channel, we have to get the various stakeholders all together, not just the control and the operators, but the uh, engineering team as well as customer team, the spacecraft team, the range team is appropriate to be able to deal with that specific issue. They get together, discuss the options, look at the uh, path forward, lay out the activities that need to occur, and then transfer that over as, as approved over to the management channel, channel for implementation and rolling out to the team. Uh, the management channel then kind of rolls it back out to the channel one and that's what you hear. So there's a lot of discussion behind everything that you hear on channel one in terms of what we're going to do from an anomaly standpoint. Right. Well, there was a lot of great discussion yesterday. So thanks for sharing some of those insights. Thank you. As uh, ULA's director of launch operations, what's your role? 
So my role is uh, very limited on launch day. I sit back and watch. But uh, it's all the activities that occur before that and, and actually making sure that the team has everything they need to do their job. Uh, from, a, from a processing standpoint, the rocket starts much earlier. You start back in the factory and it rolls for several uh, months and then eventually gets delivered to the launch site for this particular mission at Roll 47. Um, you know, that, that came earlier in the year and the team had to process the rocket test the rocket, make sure that everything was ready. And to do that, I, my job is to make sure they've got the tools and the resources and the people and everything to make it successful. Right. So ULA has a very exciting year ahead. Can you share a bit about the missions coming up in 2018? Yeah, this is a great year. There's a lot of exciting activity. Right. Um, you know, this mission is the first of the year for our national security customer here off the West Coast. But then a week from today, we're going out to the Cape and launching the Sibbers mission off the East Coast. Um, so the, the activity kind of goes back and forth. We've got a Mars mission, which is an interplanetary mission, which will be launched here at Vandenberg in the May time frame. Uh, that's really exciting because I think that's the first interplanetary Mars mission that has occurred off the West Coast. Oh, wow. And as you know, the Mars activity associated with exploration is really exciting. A lot of people interested in that mission. Absolutely. Uh, and then we go back to the Cape um, early, mid middle of the year for the Polar Parker Solar Probe, which is a Delta IV Heavy. Those are always exciting. Yep. And, uh, and then we kind of follow up at, towards the end of the year with a, a crew mission. A couple of others in between, but the commercial crew mission is really exciting because it is preparing us for putting astronauts on our rockets in the near future. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for all that great information. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, pressurization of their ullage pressure as required. Uh, with that, the team opened those valves and we are returning We've returned to a nominal condition for tanker pressurization. Uh, pumps are back to a nominal condition. And all and other related valves were also checked uh, while the team was out there to ensure that we have a correct valve configuration in all the other uh, locations at the helium area. So with that, we're back to a nominal condition uh, with no concerns for proceeding into the count. So, uh, and we're at a very healthy uh, 5,900 plus on our helium outlet pressure. So we're ready to uh, proceed into the count. And that is the recommendation of the Anomaly Team LC. That concludes my LC. LC concurs, LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. And with that, LD, I'll go ahead and they, uh, pick up with operations and resume the clock. Roger, concur. RLM, Elsie. Go ahead. You have a go to clear OTCs. Copy. And we're line clearing line. Uh, OTC 755-756. Proceed. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. The launch team has resolved the issue with the ground helium system and we are awaiting an updated T0. We will provide any updates as more information is available. Okay, test will need to wait till after CVS nozzle test. Cup. LC, RL on that one. Go. Redline monitor is active. Roger. LC locks two. Go. Second stage lock topping and 30 minute conditioning is complete. Roger. Countdown clock is resuming. LC locks one. Go. CVC locks topping and 45 minute conditioning is complete. Roger. MAQ, LC. Go ahead, LC. Swing arm system to launch mode. Roger. OS LC. OS one. Perform vulnerable data transfer to backup CGLS. Roger. LC SYS. Go SYS. Step 670, primary cycle task is complete.
Roger. LC flight control. Stand by one flight control. Panic. Go ahead. Proceed with uh, second stage helium bottle pressure decay test. Roger. Okay, and uh, flight control, go. Yeah, step 900. The L3 primary steering file, adjust underscore delta victor 380 underscore 05 with SDL CRC for delta Charlie 8 has been received, verified, and ready to load into the ECA. Proceed with load. T-minus one hour and five minutes. LC, LD, Channel 1. Go, LD. LC, at this time, please coordinate a new T0 of 22 colon 11 colon 00. Roger. RC, LC, Net 1. RC. Please coordinate a new T0 22 colon 11 colon 00. Copy. 22 Zulu in work. ALC, please set for a new T0, 22 colon 11 colon 00. And clock is uh, indicating uh, T0 of 22 11 Zulu. Roger. SC, LC, net one. Spacecraft coordinator, LC, net one. Go ahead. Just want to verify spacecraft team has resumed their uh, operations. That's confirmed. Roger. LC fuel two. Go fuel two. Second stage LH two CVS nozzle test complete. Roger. LC CME on one. Go. Yeah, voice comm to the pad uh, is disabled. Roger. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. The launch team has resolved an issue with the ground helium system, and we are working towards a new T zero of two eleven p.m. Pacific time. We recently received a final briefing from Captain Ross Malagani, the 30th Space Wing's weather officer. The weather is within the launch commit criteria for today's liftoff. Let's take a look at the numbers. The probability of violating launch constraints is 20%. The ground winds are 12 knots out of the north, and the temperature is 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So the weather looks favorable again today, and we are proceeding with preparations for launch.
RC, LC, that one. Yeah, yeah, LC, RC. The range can support. So RC, LC, verify range ready for FTF open loop test. And the range is uh, said they'll be ready for that at 2105 Zulu. Roger, 2105 Zulu. Flight control L LC net one. T minus one hour. Flight control net one. Are you in a position you can proceed with uh, flight control final preps? Yes, I could put that in work. Yeah, I'll put that in work prior to doing open loop test. So proceed. Roger. The Delta rocket has a robust history of support to our nation and the world. While the launch team proceeds with launch processing, let's have a look at a video highlighting Delta's legacy. On January 20th, 2011, a Delta IV heavy launch vehicle lifted off from Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Air Force Base, carrying the L-49 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. More than 50 years in the making, the Delta IV Heavy was the largest rocket to launch from California's Western Range and was a fitting tribute to Delta's legacy of support to our nation. We have liftoff. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket carrying the NROL-49 mission to the National Reconnaissance Office. 
This marks the first West Coast Delta IV heavy launch. Though first launched in 1960, Delta Story really begins in the mid-1950s with the development of the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. Named after the Norse God of Thunder, Thor was created in response to a growing fear that the Soviet Union would beat the U.S. in the deployment of a long-range ballistic missile. The goal was to design a system that could deliver a nuclear warhead to a target 2,300 miles away, the distance between the United Kingdom and Moscow. On January 25, 1957, the first Thor lifted off from the newly constructed Space Launch Complex 17 at Cape Canaveral. Following a series of early failures, the Thor team celebrated their first success on September 20, 1957. In all, 59 Thor IRBMs were launched, with the last flight occurring in 1975. Thor began the transition from missile to space launch vehicle in 1958. On October 11, 1958, America's newly formed space agency marked its inaugural launch when Thor Abel boosted NASA's Pioneer 1 on a mission to the moon, and NASA's long partnership with Thor was born. NASA and the Douglas Aircraft Company began development of the fourth and longest lasting Thor configuration in April 1959. Using a Thor first stage and a Vanguard second and third stage, Delta One lifted off on May 13, 1960, from Cape Canaveral's Space Launch Complex 17. Though its first launch was not successful, the Delta team quickly pinpointed the failure and three months later delivered NASA's Echo-1 communication satellite to orbit. Following Echo-1, the Delta team racked up an impressive 22 successful launches. Led by Bill Schindler, the Delta rocket earned its industry workhorse moniker for rapidly establishing itself as one of the most reliable and versatile launchers. In the 1960s, Delta launch vehicles paved the way for the burgeoning communications industry, launched America's first weather satellites, and sent probes to explore our universe. AT&T's Telstar 1, the first commercial communication satellite, launched in 1962. And in 1963, Syncom 2 became the world's first geosynchronous satellite. Tyros, or Television Infrared Observation Satellites, provided the National Weather Service with man's first view of the Earth's cloud cover. In orbit around the Earth, Moon, and Sun, NASA's Explorer satellites provided us with a deeper understanding of the solar wind, cosmic rays, and Earth's magnetic field and radiation belts. By the end of the decade, launch vehicle modifications, including the addition of solid rocket motors and an upgraded third stage, made it possible for Delta to orbit satellites 10 times larger. The 1970s was an international decade for Delta, as the manifest included scientific and communication satellites for several countries across North America, Europe, and Asia. Perhaps the most demanding challenge of the 1970s was the launch of the Earth Imaging Earth Resources Technology Satellite. Later known as Landsat, the mission for the Earth Sciences community required major changes to the Delta propulsion and guidance systems. During the 1980s, Delta continued its reliable service to the communications, weather, and Earth imaging communities. But as capable as the Delta rocket proved to be, production came to a halt in the early 80s when national space policy dictated that the space shuttle be used as the U.S.'s primary launcher, signaling the end of the expendable launch vehicle. But in 1987, the Delta team picked up where they left off, and development began on a launch vehicle to support the Air Force's global positioning system. On February 14, 1989, Delta 184 began a new chapter in Space Launch history as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 17. Demonstrating an incredible feat, the Delta II had gone from development to launch in just two years. To accommodate the larger GPS satellites, engineers improved the Delta rocket in several ways. The fuel tanks were stretched, a new payload fairing was developed, and larger solid rocket motors were incorporated. The modifications resulted in increased performance and flexibility. By the mid-1990s, the Delta II had delivered the fully operational 24-satellite GPS constellation. And though it was developed for the Air Force, Delta again became a reliable partner to both NASA and its commercial customers. We have good separation on all three airlift solids. 
Over the course of its more than 20-year run, the Delta II has launched some of America's best-known scientific and exploration missions. We have main engine start, zero, and liftoff of the Stardust spacecraft, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket carrying the spirit from Earth to planet Mars. Liftoff of the Delta II with Grail. On the commercial side, Delta II launched the Global Star and Iridium constellations, which brought satellite telephone communication to the world. Continuing its evolution to meet the growing demands of its satellite customers, the Delta team developed the more powerful Delta III. Though short-lived, the Delta III doubled the performance of the Delta II. So we have ignition, ignition and liftoff of the Boeing Delta III rocket. In partnership with the Air Force's Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program, the Delta team began development of the next generation Delta IV rocket in the mid-1990s. Main engine Zero. start. And we have liftoff of the first no, Boeing yeah. Delta IV rocket and carrying the W-5 telecommunications satellite for Eutelsat of France. All Delta IV configurations begin with a common booster core, powered by the RS-68 main engine. Solid rocket motors provide additional thrust at liftoff, and the choice of a 4 or 5 meter diameter payload fairing allows the Delta IV to more precisely accommodate varying payload sizes. The Delta IV Heavy, with its three common booster cores, delivers our nation's largest missions to orbit. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket, carrying the NROL-32 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Delta IV launch vehicles are produced at a 1.5 million square foot state-of-the-art facility in Decatur, Alabama. Processing and launch takes place at Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Green safety arm light on. From its early beginnings as a weapon and deterrent through its transformation into a space launch vehicle, Delta has reliably supported our nation for more than 50 years. Delta's legacy as a workhorse continues today and is a testament to the persistence, dedication, and commitment of an enterprising team that has continually evolved the Delta rocket to support a changing world. And liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket. This is Delta Mission Control. The launch team is working towards a T0 of 2.11 p.m. Pacific Time. LC, FTS. Go. Per step 680, FTS open loop checks are complete. Roger. And for all personnel on that one, this is LC. We are complete through operation 50, step 760.
working per the clock and tracking no issues at this time. While the launch team continues with launch processing, let's take a look at a video highlighting the critical role of the NRO's mission manager. ALC, go. AC. AC is go. RC, clear to proceed. Launch direct. The launch vehicle is ready to launch. The National Reconnaissance Office is focused on overhead intelligence, really focused on our satellite systems that are able to provide persistent overhead intelligence, especially focused on areas of denied access. A mission manager is responsible for mission integration, and, and what that means is we have a whole team of folks that are responsible for making sure that the launch vehicle is secure, is safe, uh, is well built, and it goes through the proper factory processes. We also have a whole team that does that on the satellite vehicle side. My job as a mission manager is to bring those two together and really focus on the payload to launch vehicle interface. I was the mission manager for NRL 55. It's one of those unique jobs that you, you kind of get hand-selected for just based off of job performance. It's a job that's very unique in the Air Force that you, at a very junior level, are able to be responsible for a, a multi-billion dollar satellite. When I started as a mission manager, I was 27 years old. It's been a great experience for me at such a young age to have that opportunity to really excel and to learn, and learn by doing, not by watching others do. So being a mission manager for the NRO is a huge benefit to future jobs as a senior officer, having to interact with senior leaders, understanding technical information and being able to communicate that to anybody else who needs to know those details. So I'm responsible for uh, the spacecraft as it processes through the launch base, gets rolled out to the pad and stacked onto the launch vehicle, and then the actual operation to launch the rocket and put the satellite on orbit. The people who make the decisions, the mission director, the program director, they have a lot of responsibility to make sure that this payload gets put on orbit safely. But the fact is that I'm the guy who knows exactly what's going on with the mission on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm the one who's explaining all those details to the people that are high up in the organization. Four, we have main engine ignition, two, one, and lift off. So I've launched about 12 missions so far. Each launch is different, each launch is hard, and you feel great after it gets off the ground and gets up into orbit. I was a mission manager for one launch back in uh, 2009 to 2011. The most favorite job I had in the Air Force so far taught me so much about how uh, small we are individually, but how powerful we are as a team. The mission manager job I think is really designed to be a junior level captain early major because it, it gives you an opportunity to learn so much about a system. You learn from the requirements phase to the operations phase. You are involved in every aspect of a mission and that's, that's crucial in the development of Air Force officers and, and future leaders in the NRO. The day of launch was very tense. I remember those last few seconds very vividly. We were all watching the clock and as soon as those rofies ignite and that plume went up around the rocket and you just pray that thing gets off the ground and it did and we had a moment where we could run outside and check it out and, and it was fantastic. Launching is a means to an end. Being able to actually put a satellite in orbit is why we're here. So the fact that my launch vehicle was able to put our satellite in the right orbit at the right time was what mattered. And so once we got confirmation of that, it, it was the, the moment I had been waiting for, which is to really be able to celebrate our accomplishment.
My job is the best job in the National Reconnaissance Office. It's been hard and challenging, and that's really what uh, makes the job fun. It's working together with the community to put this payload on with it for the warfighter. Overhead reconnaissance is a unique capability that the NRO brings to the fight to secure our nation, and the Air Force plays a vital role in that mission. The NRO mission manager assignment is no doubt one of the coolest jobs on the planet, launching multi-billion dollar satellites into orbit to deliver the right information at the right time to warfighters and intelligence analysts. But the fact is, there are a ton of amazing jobs in the NRO. And joining our team is not simply a career move, it's a calling to serve a truly unique mission. As a mid-grade Air Force officer, you'll work with thousands of dedicated service members and civilians at the cutting edge of technology, providing safety and security for the American people and our friends around the globe. Visit us online at nro.gov to learn more about our amazing team and mission. This is Delta Mission Control. The launch team is continuing to work towards liftoff today at 2.11 p.m. Pacific Time. The weather continues to look favorable, and we are not working any issues at this time.
<laughs> this guy. Uh, T minus 35 minutes. While the launch team continues to prepare for today's launch of NROL 47, let's take a look at more of my conversation with ULA's Tony Talianchis. Tony, thanks for joining me. Thank you. So the the polling at L minus seven minutes is always an exciting time. Can you walk us through the process, the what the team's going through, what data they're looking at to make the go no go decision? Certainly. You know the team has a very important set of roles and responsibilities and specific functions, and they're all organized around those functions. Um, most of it deals with specific parts of the rocket and what we're actually doing in that part of the rocket to get it ready, but also a lot of other areas where we're integrating systems and fluids and we're taking the, the control, command and control of the team and, and making sure everybody's integrated together. So all of those things have to come together at that pole. And so you hear a list of the different systems and functions that are occurring as well as some of the, the uh, range support, um, uh, safety, quality, all, all of the others that are involved in making sure we're ready to go. And one of the real key parts of that polling process to make sure that communications is actually working, that they can actually communicate with each other on channel one as we get into the final part of the count. So while it's a test of the system it's, that are ready to launch, it's also a test of the communication system to make sure that it's functioning and effective if there's a reason to call a hold as we get into the terminal count sequence. All right. So prior to joining ULA, you were in the Air Force. Yes. Uh, how many rocket launches do you think you've been a part of? That's a good question. I lost count a long time ago. Um, you know, I started, my, my first rocket launch activity was in 1988 um, wow. with some test rockets that we were doing, uh, and I was in the development side of things. Uh, over the years, I've worked a lot of systems, Titan, Pegasus, Delta, Atlas, um, some other missions that, that uh, are a little different. Um, I think the last count was over 160 or so. So with all your experience, can you tell us, is rocket science really as hard as it looks? <laughs> you know, rocket science is like any other science. Um, it is challenging and it requires a, a huge amount of skill and capability, but it's all about process. It is about making sure that everybody understands their roles, that we manage and, and understand the risk is executing um, the the things that need to happen properly to make sure the team's safe and that the mission's successful in the end. So is it hard? Yes, it's hard. There's a, there's a saying that there have to be a million uh, miracles for a launch, rocket launch to go occur, but it's really not a million miracles. It's a mir million activities very specifically focused and managed to make sure that you're successful. Well, uh, it is very exciting and challenging business. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you. L minus 41 minutes. Box two, start second stage locks final conditioning. Roger. Second stage locks final conditioning in progress. This is Delta Mission Control. The launch team resolved an issue earlier today on our ground helium system, and we are continuing to work towards a T0 of 2.11 p.m. Pacific time. The weather continues to be favorable, and we are working no issues at this time.
T minus 30 minutes. L minus 38 minutes. As we continue with launch processing for today's launch of NROL 47, let's take a look at a video highlighting our 2017 launches, three of which were for the National Reconnaissance Office.
And I don't... No, methane is the one that smells like eggs. Yeah, it probably would smell bad. The first rocket I watched was Delta II. Nice, nice. How much bigger is Falcon Heavy compared to this vehicle? Uh, not, not much bigger. Uh, Delta's, Delta's a good rocket, but Delta doesn't, isn't really tall. Delta's got some girth to it, man. The core size is huge. RCLC Net One. RC. Conduct weather briefing on Channel Eight Weather Conference Net. Roger. L minus thirty minutes.
We recently received a final briefing from Captain Ross Malagani, the 30th Space Wing's weather officer. The weather is within the launch commit criteria for today's liftoff. Let's take a look at the numbers. The probability of violating launch constraints is 20%. The ground winds are 12 knots out of the north, and the temperature is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So the weather looks favorable again today, and we are proceeding towards liftoff with a plan T0 of 2.11 p.m. Pacific. LC flight control. Go flight control. Step 890. Flight control final preps complete. Roger. HYE LC. Verified. Roger. L minus 25 minutes. Yesterday, I spoke with the NRO's chief historian, Dr. James Altson, about the NRO and their important mission in history. Let's take a look. Dr. Altson, thanks for joining me today. I'm glad to be here with you. Can you tell me a bit about the formation of the NRO and how its mission has evolved? Yes, I sure can. Um, the National Reconnaissance Office uh, actually grew out of uh, the aftermath of, of World War II. Uh, after uh, the World War II concluded, there were leaders that recognized the importance of uh, taking emerging technology and using that technology to pr protect the United States and defend the interests of the United States. Uh, at the time, there were scientists and technologists that were looking at using space as a vantage point uh, to uh, gain information. And uh, it made good sense for the United States to invest resources into that kind of technology. Over time, uh, there were independent programs that developed uh, in the Air Force, in the Central Intelligence Agency, and in the Navy, uh, programs developing national reconnaissance uh, satellites. And by the late 1950s and into 1960, those programs were well along. Uh, and uh, the Eisenhower administration later John, or, and later Kennedy uh, administration rec recognized it would make sense to consolidate those programs into a single organization, and that's how the National Reconnaissance Office uh, was formed. It was formed uh, by an agreement uh, between the Central Intelligence Agency and Department of Defense uh, in September of, uh, of 1961. So can you uh, tell me a little bit about how the NRO fits in with the rest of the national intelligence community and how you work together to support the nation's needs? Sure. Um, intelligence is uh, it, it's like uh, putting a puzzle together. Uh, what we try to do is come up with uh, enough information that we can assemble to understand uh, what our adversaries' capabilities are and what their intents are. What the National Reconnaissance Office is able to do is bring unique intelligence, intelligence that comes from space uh, through imagery collection and through signals collection, and it provides additional details and insights into what those intentions and capabilities of our adversaries are. We then assemble that wide range of information uh, into as comprehensive of, of a picture as possible, and that then allows us to make uh, informed decisions on how to uh, continue to carry out our national security responsibilities. So I know a lot of the information that you deal with is very sensitive, but can you share some of the direct impacts that the NRO has had? Yeah, not current impacts, but we can actually go back in time uh, to give you a sense of uh, how the systems have made a, uh, made a difference. Uh, one great example is uh, 
back in the early days of the Cold War, there was a pressing question of uh, how quickly the Soviets were able to develop their intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, because the Soviet Union was a vast area, a denied area, where we, we didn't have ready access, we needed some kind of means to go in and find out what those production rates look like. And it turns out that reconnaissance satellites uh, provided us those means. So we were able to take pictures of broad areas of the Soviet Union and, and collect signals and intelligence, which would allow us to assemble a, a picture of the overall uh, uh, nuclear uh, missile strength of the Soviets. And then that allowed us to answer the question, could they do it more quickly than us? Uh, were the capabilities stronger than, uh, than ours? And we found out that uh, we were uh, producing missiles uh, more quickly, better capabilities, which in turn allowed us to uh, make better uh, investments of our resources, both militarily and domestically, all towards uh, protecting the interests of the nation and uh, preserving peace. So that's uh, some of the great impacts that you've had from an information and historical perspective. Can you share uh, more on the technology development that the NRO has uh, had an impact on? Yeah, again, not current technologies, but we can actually see how the NRO invested in uh, technologies that uh, eventually found their way uh, into uh, the commercial realm, as an example. Uh, we uh, had to solve one basic problem, which is how you get a picture from space. And uh, that uh, initially allowed us to invest in, uh, to film technology, and then later into digital technology. Uh, in today's world, we are able to take images in near real time, and we made early investments in digital uh, imagery, which have ha eventually worked their way into commercial technology. Uh, another example is uh, mammography. Uh, uh, one of the challenges of intelligence is to see how your uh, adversary's capabilities change over time to do change detection. Well, mammography is a derivative of that. You're, mm -hmm. You want to establish a baseline and, and look for changes. So it's another example of how uh, technology has, has found its way into the commercial world and, and other very practical applications. Oh, well. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time and sharing all that really fascinating information. You're very welcome. minutes, nine minutes. This is Delta Mission Control. The launch team is continuing to work towards a T0 of 2.11 p.m. Pacific Time. The weather continues to be favorable, and we are working no issues at this time. GE, verify Tissler status ready. Tissler status ready. SYS, establish best source selector locked on RF and range sources. Roger. Patch downrange source into DCOMs and CGLS2. Roger. Initiate orbital parameter calculations on backup CGLS. Roger. LC, best source selector locked on RF and range sources. Roger. T minus seven minutes.
T-minus six minutes. PL2, perform a second stage LH2 fill and drain valve cycle test. Roger. In a few seconds, the launch count will enter a planned 10-minute hold. This hold gives the launch team time to conduct final systems checks and resolve outstanding issues prior to entering the terminal count. At this time, the team is not working any issues. Uh, LC, this is the elbow on countdown one. Hello. So uh, we just uh, we've been flirting around with the strength there out of the north, and we just picked up a T one minute mean of four minutes in holding. This is a ten minute built-in hold. Uh, for the hold. twenty knot constraint out of the. Roger. 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 LC switch to not ready. Box 2, can you verify uh, tank penning in progress? Tank penning in progress. Roger. Has gas established scan pattern 140. Roger. BSC, verify base bending moment instrumentation is active and data is valid. BBM is fully mission capable. Recommend placard 6 Alpha for launch. Roger. LWO, LC, that one. This is the LWO. Transition to wind placard 6 alpha for launch at T minus 4 minutes and counting. Double copy 6 alpha. L minus 12 minutes. This is Delta Mission Control. The Delta IV NROL-47 mission is dedicated in memory of our colleague and friend, Mike Hewitt. Mike began his career in the late 1970s working on the Delta program and later Atlas following the formation of UOA. He was part of the supply chain team, working for supplier management, program management, and supplier quality. Mike worked with numerous suppliers throughout his career and was known for his troubleshooting, supplier inspections, and oversight. Mike will be forever memorialized with the liftoff of NROL-47.
RC, verify solar radiation limits acceptable for launch. Verified. MAQ, swing arm lock pins to pull. Active. L minus 10 minutes. All communications switch to channel one. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after a terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. Flight control perform launch on time verification. Roger. SC transfer spacecraft to internal power. Roger. USO verify the hold fire switches in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM verify red line monitor and event table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. L minus nine minutes. Launch on time verified. Roger. And MAQ status of the pins. Swing arm lock pins are pulled. Roger. RLM, force items, events 30 and 31. On active. LC switch to ready position. All steps are complete prior to status check. L minus eight minutes. LC, RLM, Go. one, uh, event 30. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. We remain in the plan 10 minute built in hold as preparations for launch continue. In a few moments, launch conductor Scott Barney will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 31 engineers and managers will be pulled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Western Range. The vehicle system readiness pull includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as Scott Barney performs the final pulling of the launch team. L minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count. First aid system propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Com. Go. GCQ. Go. Operations support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hazgas. Go. ACS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. BC is go. Anomaly chief. AC is go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. The launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. L minus six minutes. VSC established LOI DAS is recording data. LOI is ready. Pulling is complete and the launch team has given the go for launch. From T minus four minutes until launch, you will be listening to launch conductor Scott Barney and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. At T minus four minutes and counting, the team will enter the terminal count and will begin securing the second stage liquid oxygen tank. At T minus three minutes, 32 seconds, CBC liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tank securing is started, which includes closing the propellant fill and drain valves. 
also at T minus three minutes, 32 seconds, vehicle transfer from ground facility power to its own internal battery power will be complete. At T minus three minutes, the vehicle ordnance system will be armed and the booster liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellant tanks are verified to be at flight pressure and flight level. At two minutes prior to liftoff, the team will verify that the hydraulic system is pressurized as well as confirm booster, DCSS, and flight termination system battery voltages. At T minus one minute, 20 seconds, the team will begin securing the second stage liquid hydrogen tank. At T minus 60 seconds, the Western Range readiness is verified. At T minus 50 seconds, the DCSS liquid hydrogen tank is secured at flight level. A final launch vehicle and spacecraft status check is conducted at T minus 25 seconds. At T minus 15 seconds, the ROFIs or sparklers are ignited to burn off the excess hydrogen at the base of the vehicle. Liftoff will occur at T zero. After liftoff, you'll hear the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle ascent data. T minus four minutes and counting. 355. Ground pyros enabled. The countdown clock has resumed, and we are go for launch at 2.11 p.m. Pacific. Second stage lock secure at flight level. Three oh seven. Two forty nine. FTS internal. CBC locks flight pressure and flight level. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. Two minutes, 159. Hydraulic pressure at 4,000. Vehicle internal. 155. Launch sequence or start. One forty. SCS launch enable. 137. T minus 90 seconds, the launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and western range are go for launch. 120. OCU's on. FCS count started. One minute. T minus one minute. Go. Rock, report range status. Range is green. 50. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Status check. T minus 30 Go seconds. Delta. Go NROL 47. 23. 
SRMTVC blowdown. 15. Rofi ignition. 10. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. We have ignition of the R68A main engine. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the NROL-47 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Back into the flight. R68 chamber pressure looks good. Fuel injector pressure also looks good. You're, You're hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch motors. vehicle ascent data. Burn profile on the solid rocket motors appears to be within family. Now passing 25 seconds into flight. And now 35 seconds in. Still seeing good chamber pressure and injector pressure on the RS-68. Good good chamber pressure on both solid rocket motors. Now coming up on 49 seconds into the flight, Mach 1, Delta 4 is now supersonic. And 55 seconds in, max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. And continuing to see good chamber pressure on the RS-68. Launch vehicle is now 8.5 miles in altitude or 0.8 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,400 miles per hour. One minute, 15 seconds into flight. Approximately 20 seconds remaining until SRM burnout. And continuing to see good chamber pressure on the RS-68. Now one minute, 30 seconds in, standing by for SRM burnout shortly. And we have SRM burnout, standing by for jettison. And we have good jettison on both solid rocket motors. Now 1 minute 45 seconds into flight. Continuing to see good chamber pressure on the RS-68, good fuel injector pressures as well. And the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 2,000 pounds per second. Just over 2 minutes into flight. And the ACS press valve has been opened. System pressure response looks good. Two minutes, 10 seconds into flight. And at two minutes, 22 seconds into flight, vehicle is now passing Mach 5, traveling at five times the speed of sound. Launch vehicle is now 50 miles in altitude, 34 miles downrange distance, traveling at 3,700 miles per hour. Two minutes, 40 seconds into flight. And upper stage lock system has begun boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the Arlton engine. One minute to BECO. And fuel system has begun boost phase chill down. We have good indication of payload fairing jettison. Now three minutes, 15 seconds into flight, vehicle is now passing Mach 10. And about 30 seconds remaining in first stage phase of flight. RS-68 continues to perform well, fuel injector and chamber pressures look good. And the launch vehicle is now 100. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 3 minutes 42 seconds. We've just seen the successful liftoff of the Delta IV rocket carrying the NROL 47 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office, and all systems continue to operate nominally. Liftoff occurred at 2.11 p.m. Pacific. At our customer's request, we'll now conclude our live coverage. Thanks to ULA's Patrick Moore for his participation in this afternoon's show. For more information on ULA, or the Delta IV, visit ulalaunch.com or join the conversation on Twitter and Facebook. We'll leave you now with another look at today's liftoff. I'm Mike Underhill, and on behalf of the entire launch team, thank you for joining us and have a great day. Six, five, four, three, two. We have ignition of the RS-68A main engine.
And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the NROL-47 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. 10 seconds into the flight. R-68 chamber pressure looks good. Fuel injector pressure also looks good. Team You're hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch motors. vehicle ascent data. Burn profile on the solid rocket motors appears to be within family. Now passing 25 seconds into flight. 